These final series of lectures will be devoted to the idea of power analysis and experimental design. Um, and so when we're talking about experimental design, uh, it's worth pointing out that statistics up to this point in the class have been used to analyze results of experiments. So um, analyze what you've done after an experiment. But it's worth noting that statistics can also be used to help you design your experiments. Um, and so with experimental design and power analysis, what we're talking about when we talk about power analysis is the use of statistics to estimate uh, the sample size need, needed to uh, get a significant result. So you can actually use uh, statistics to figure out how many times you have to run an experiment to get a desired uh, statistically significant result. And so this is important for uh, actual real life situations. Uh, for example, you know, if you're working for a company and you're designing experiments and you have certain financial constraints, being able to at least estimate uh, the, you know, the small sample size you'll need to uh, get a result. Or if you're doing um, result or if you're doing experiments on living subjects because of course you don't you want to minimize the amount that you'll have to put a specific drug uh, into a human for example. Um, so power analysis first thing we're going to do is go over the uh, inputs needed for doing power analysis so there'll be a few definitions and the first is um, is what your is your effect size. So effect size is the size between uh, your null hypothesis and what you hope to detect, um, yeah, which we'll get into in uh, more detail later. Uh, next is significance, which you've seen before, and it's it's the uh, the probability of rejecting a uh, null hypothesis even though it's true. So it's the probability of a type one error. It's also known as a false positive. Um, we need to know the power, which, if you recall from uh, earlier lectures. Um, is 1 minus beta, where beta is the probability of accepting the null hypothesis even though it's false, so a false negative. And so power is the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis. Power can be thought of as the probability of rejecting the null hypothesis when the real difference is equal to the minimum effect size. And we'll delve a little more into what that means in a moment. So uh, uh, statistical, uh, an experimental design with high power will allow for detecting your effect size and generally a, a power of uh, 0.8 or greater is considered to be a statistically powerful design. So going over type 1 error, uh, uh, again, if uh, this is a sample um, uh, distribution of your null hypothesis, um, if we can calculate a t-critical value for which the area under, under the curve to the right of it on the t-distribution is equal to alpha. And so, again, if you're the t-statistic you calculate or the z-statistic is greater than this, um, this cutoff value, then you're uh, in the rejection region and you would reject the null hypothesis. And in general, significance is uh, tends to be set before the experiment uh, uh, and a lot of times it's you know set to 0 0.05 and this is a good practice because uh, researchers can't arbitrarily choose uh, the threshold for significance based upon what the uh, data gives you. It, um, it sets a constraint before you actually start an experiment. So with type 2 error, type 2 error is frequently used in reference to a specific alternate hypothesis. Uh, up to this point, we'd only been considering uh, alternate hypotheses, but it can be broken down even more so into what's called specific alternate hypotheses. And again, type 2 error, uh, just to hammer the point home more, is not rejecting the null hypothesis when it should be rejected. And so a specific alternate hypothesis is an alternate hypothesis that's more detailed than the general alternate hypothesis, kind of like a subset of it. So, for example, if you have a null hypothesis that uh, a mean is equal to zero, um, your uh, general alternate hypothesis for a two-way test would be that it's not equal to zero. But uh, 
more specific null, or alternate hypothesis could be that it's actually equal to 1. So you're actually setting what it is uh, that would be different than, uh, than your null hypothesis. And in this case, if you set your specific alternate hypothesis to 1 and your null hypothesis is 0, your effect size would be 1 minus 0 or 1. And so to get a even further grasp of, the diff of what type 1 and type 2 error are, um, if uh, this is a little table that kind of shows that um, uh, what I'm talking about, where if the null hypothesis is true and you reject it, you've committed type 1 error. And if the null hypothesis is false and you fail to reject it or accept it, you've committed type 2 error. You can think of this as an example where you're assuming uh, a trial and somebody's being brought to trial for a crime. And uh, the null hypothesis in the, the court of law is that a defendant is not guilty. And so the alternate hypothesis would be that the defendant is guilty. Um, so type 1 error in that instance is, would be um, convicting an innocent person because you're you're rejecting the null hypothesis, so you're saying the defendant is guilty when, in fact, they aren't. Uh, where and type two error, uh, instead, on the flip side, would be um, setting a guilty person free. So the person is not guilty, but we fail to reject the null hypothesis and we set a guilty person free. So graphically what this means is, um, say we have the same example before where we have a null hypothesis and that's, this is the distribution of our null hypothesis in blue. And we have a specific alternate hypothesis and this is the distribution of it in black. So uh, say for example, we find a t-critical value for our null hypothesis of uh, just less than two. So we're gonna draw a line here and so the area under the curve to the right of that t-critical value uh, on the null hypothesis distribution, again, is alpha, which is generally set to 0 0.05. So this is the, to the right of this value is the rejection region for, uh, for, the, uh, for the null hypothesis. You'd reject the null hypothesis if a t-statistic was to the right of this. And so the, the way of thinking about type 2 error is if the, if the true mean is 1, like we say in our specific alternate hypothesis, we ought to reject the null hypothesis. But the area under the curve to the left, to the left of uh, uh, this t-critical value on the alternate hypothesis distribution uh, is in the acceptance region, right? Because anything to the left is accepting the null hypothesis. And so we've actually, um, so all of this area under the curve in the specific alternate hypothesis distribution would be accepting the null hypothesis when, uh, when we shouldn't. And so this is what's called beta. So again, the going from, uh, from the t-critical value here, uh, this, then this, was, this would be an extremely high beta, which would lead to a low power. So it would be very tough to discern the differences between these two. And that makes sense because there's so much overlap between these two distributions. They're not very distinct. So how can we affect this? how can we affect power and hopefully increase the power of our studies? The first is by hopefully is maybe by uh, designing your experiment where you could increase your effect size or the difference between uh, the two peaks of your null and specific alternate hypotheses. So if we, so again, if this is what we had before where it was zero and one, if we increase the effect size where it becomes, the null hypothesis stays at zero, but now we want to uh, detect a difference of two with our effect size, our the the 
distribution for a specific alternate hypothesis shifts one spot to the right, you can see that there's less of an overlap in the distribution, which if we pick the same point for our t critical value, uh, we can see that the area under the curve, this beta, has decreased relative to what it once was. So we're increasing our power by uh, increasing our effect size. Another thing that can affect the power is, uh, is variability in the design of your experiment. Uh, high variability in, in the way it's designed could lead to a large spread of your distribution. So smaller spreads or much tighter distributions around a mean will increase your power. So you can decrease variability in a number of ways. Uh, for example, if you're doing uh, experiments on uh, human subjects, for example, you can make sure that the human subjects are at the uh, same point before treatment. So uh, that's frequently why you see people have been uh, uh, told not to eat or not to drink water for a certain amount of time before an experiment. So hopefully all human subjects come in at the relatively the same point. You can also maximize sample sizes of groups. So if you have a larger sample size where everybody's presumed to be equal, hopefully the distribution will be much tighter uh, around a mean and it'll actually decrease your standard error because if you recall standard error uh, is uh, the standard deviation divided by the square root of n so if you increase n you'll be decreasing your standard error hopefully. So going back to this previous plot with uh, the null hypothesis at mu equals 0 and the specific alternate hypothesis at mu equals 2 this is our beta right here now imagine uh, another, imagine when we talk about decreasing variability, if we, uh, decreasing variability would be decreasing the spread of these um, distributions. And you can see by decreasing the spread of the distributions, the overlap uh, is decreased a great deal. And so you can see that they're much more distinct, which would give you a much more powerful uh, uh, experimental design.